Worldwide, there are more than 200 highly toxic algae species. They proliferate in sudden bursts, resulting in massive algae blooms. The consequence? Fish and marine mammals die. Mussels ingest the algae toxins and thereby become a deadly threat. In less than one hour, my youngest child died. Mussel farmers around the world suffer from the toxic algal blooms, and they are increasing in frequency and severity. To find out that your customers have ended up becoming ill from your produce that was a big blow to us. During a shipping expedition along the Irish coast, scientists are looking after a new algae species. Its venom was identified only a few years ago. We found this fraction that contained a new unknown toxin. How widespread is this new algae and does it constitute a threat? It's a bit like a, like a detective story. Scientists worldwide set out to uncover the killer algae. Hillary Harbour on the west coast of Ireland. Only a handful of people live on this 20 kilometer long fjord. Their main sources of income are tourism, sheep rearing and fishing. In the 1980s this fjord was identified for mussel farming. My name is Simon Kennedy. I've been farming mussels here in Killary Harbour for the last 21 years. And I have about, on average, 30 lines on a 14 hectare farm and produce 250 tonnes per year. Killary Harbour has experienced a boom in mussel farming in the last decades. Today, the fjord is home to about 30 mussel farmers. But as the industry grew, the mussel farmers always needed to respect the natural cycle of water quality. Mussels are filter feeders and thus also absorb toxins in the water. These toxins are mostly present during the summer months, hence the traditional harvest season is winter. But the presence of toxins is changing. There's an old saying that you can only eat mussels with any month that has an R in it, but we now know that that's not as valid as it used to be because we have on occasion detected toxins in the middle of winter. And so we now rely on the Marine Institute and the science for our better judgment. The Marine Institute in Galway is the center for the analysis of Irish mussels. Mussel samples from across the mussel growing regions are analyzed daily for toxic residues. The origin of the toxins becomes visible under the microscope, single-celled algae. When these protozoa suddenly divide exponentially, scientists refer to them as harmful algae blooms, or HABs. During such a bloom, the mussels accumulate dangerous levels of toxins in their filtering tissue. It is a large problem. The Irish shellfish industry is worth about 50 to 60 million euros per annum. Uh, if we didn't have the HABs problem, the potential would be huge for, uh, for the industry to really uh, take off. But unfortunately, um, the prime growing areas in the southwest of the country for, for mussels and up along the west coast, places like Killary Harbour, they have had large problems with uh, biotoxins down through the years. Uh, and this has resulted with, with them having to close down for large portions of the year. Not only marine life in Ireland is threatened by poisonous algae. Harmful algal blooms threaten animals whenever they appear, and Florida is one of the hotspots. The Sunshine State is regularly hit by the red tide, an algal bloom that paints the sea blood red. It is caused by an algae which produces the deadly neurotoxin brevitoxin. Fish are particularly vulnerable to brevitoxin. Thousands of fish are killed every year when the red tide appears. However, the poison is also extremely dangerous to sea mammals. The 
The highly endangered West Indian manatees ingest the poisonous algae while feeding. The neurotoxin paralyzes their muscles and impairs the manatee's sense of orientation. This is particularly dangerous as the animal may not find its way to the water surface for breathing and risks drowning. The park is situated along the Homosassa River, which is also a winter refuge for many wild manatees. As a freshwater resort, the river is free of the red tide agents, and thus provides a secure environment for the rehabilitation of the injured animals. The park's philosophy is simple. Provide the animals with plenty of space, with medical care, and with what they like most, food. Manatees eat up to 10% of their body weight every day, so the rangers in Hamosessa feed the vegetarian mammals four times a day with salads and vegetables. Currently, Daniel Guzman looks after six giants in their resort. Our main reason for our manatees is to get the population up, and so if somebody does see an injured manatee, um, they do go to different parts around Florida, and you get some of these um, that were injured in the wild. And so we try to rehabilitate them, um, get them good, we, you know, we feed them whatever they need, and then after that, we actually release them. And that is a whole purpose um, for one of our programs we're working with the manatees, is to get them back out there. In the last 10 years, on average, 40 manatees died from the red tide every year. But there are also other marine mammals at risk. In the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Center, Alex Costidis is inspecting dolphin carcasses found in the area. The marine biologist wants to find out if the red tide was the cause of death and analyzes the internal organs of the dolphins for traces of the deadly toxin. A lot of manatees die almost every year from red tide, but in the last few years we've been getting more and more dolphins. Basically, an animal has trouble telling its muscles to move, um, making itself get to the surface to take a breath, uh, having, telling its diaphragm to move so that it can take a breath, uh, and there are various other things that happen as well, but the neurotoxic effect is believed to be the most important part. A severe case of red tide can result in the death of hundreds of marine mammals. But even outside the water, the highly toxic substances can lead to severe health problems. During a harmful algal bloom, the wind can carry the poison over several kilometers, from the open ocean to inhabited coastal areas. This can be particularly dangerous for people suffering from respiratory diseases. My name's Dave Alvaro, and I uh, live here in Sarasota, Florida. I'm very sensitive to the red tide, extremely sensitive. I live about 10 miles east of, of the water, and if the wind is blowing, I mean, you know, you can, I can tell before it's announced on the news that there's something in the air, uh, not even being close to it. During the red tide, the Memorial Hospital in Sarasota regularly treats patients with respiratory problems. I mean, it's clear that when there's, when there's a bad red tide, there's bad illness. Looking back at the previous red tides we've had, there was a great predominance of respiratory illnesses, what we would consider typical uh, asthma attacks, as well as the additional symptoms of burning eyes, burning of the nose, runny nose. In retrospect, I think we also saw a lot more GI illnesses, a lot more nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which at the time we probably did not recognized was a cause of the uh, red tide, but now I think as studies are coming out, it is likely tied to it. Out of fear, many residents desert their beach houses during the red tide. Poisonous algae are a global problem, 
they pose the biggest threat to developing countries. The Philippines consist of over 7,000 islands. Most of its population is entirely reliant on seafood. The idyllic island paradise of the Philippines can be deceptive. Even here, the invisible algal blooms poison oceans and destroy the livelihoods of people living near the coast. In 2007, the Bay of Sorsogon City experienced an ecological disaster. The city used to be home to a flourishing mussel industry. Yet for the last four years, the harvests are continuously destroyed by the poisonous algae Pyrodinium. For the mussel farmers, it is an economic disaster. They have no regular income and thus are unable to send their children to school. One of the first people to be affected by the red tide was Lord Almesco. In October 2006, a dinner consisting of mussels had fatal consequences for Lord and her family. We ate mussels, and around one o'clock at night, my daughter began to vomit. She got weaker and weaker, and I began to ask her, baby, what is wrong with you? My daughter merely replied, Mom, I'm tired. I told her that we should go to sleep. When I awoke around four in the morning, she was asleep in my arms. As I carried her in my arms, I realized that she was not breathing. Only then did I realize that she had already died. Ireland regularly experiences harmful algal blooms. When this occurs, the mussel farms are closed for harvesting until the bloom is over. The algae die and the toxins are cleared again. Mussel farmers are used to facing these blooms during the summer months when the water is warmer and facilitates algal growth. But in November 1995, something unexpected happened. I had eaten some shellfish prior to a sale and uh, I was quite ill. So I suppose the, the, the buyer, when he had the market, encouraged me to, to harvest. And I sort of explained, well, I think there could be something wrong because I'm very ill. But at that time, there was no uh, toxin monitoring it. It was decided that maybe it was just something else I ate or just a natural occur occurring illness that I had. And uh, we, we, we continued to harvest and sell them. A few days later, Simon Kennedy learned that eight guests of a restaurant in Amsterdam were admitted to the hospital after they had eaten mussels from his latest harvest. To find out that your customers have ended up becoming ill from your produce, that was a big blow to us, to the whole industry really, at, at that, to find that out in the middle of winter. And uh, yeah, we, we discontinued from harvesting because of that. And, had to wait until the following summer before the toxins cleared and we could resume harvesting again. Since the incident of 1995 in Killary Harbour, the mussels are tested for toxins all year round in all the different Irish mussel farm regions. So if a harvest arrives in a processing plant, the wholesaler knows that they are free from any of the known toxins. The mussels are now cleaned and flavoured, packaged and pre-cooked before they reach the supermarkets. Most Irish mussels are exported to the UK and mainland Europe. Kevin Lydon still lives with the constant uncertainty that comes with the nature of mussel farming. For decades, he had to deal with the known toxic algae and their unpredictable blooms during the summer months. The newly discovered toxin AZA has increased the problem and disrupted many harvesting seasons in the last 10 years. When a harmful algae bloom appears, the mussels are not lost for good. The farmer merely needs to wait until the mussels have broken down the toxins before the harvest can resume. It depends. Years differ. Sometimes it can come in and last for quite a while, you know. You can, you can have a toxin come in, depends on the type. It might last 
only a few days. Even well, in the worst, in the best case scenario, if you get a toxin to come in to close the bay, the very minimum is going to take us two weeks before you can harvest again. That's the absolute minimum, even if it's a terribly low level. And if it's there for a few weeks, well, it's going to cost you literally months because you know you won't be allowed to harvest until they're 100% sure that the bay is clear again. Kevin Lydon knows about the importance of monitoring, as it is essential to protect his customers and his industry. He is one of the few mussel farmers in the Killery Fjord who also takes an active part in monitoring the mussel and water quality. Together with his brother, he collects samples of his lines to be analyzed in the laboratory. We lift a rope, we lift it completely out of the water,